And uh, they wanted somebody to entertain, and I said, well, I can sing. Well, meanwhile, I had to play, play drums, too, at the same time. But I got up during the intervals and sang songs to the people. And from then on, I was a crooner. That's how it all started. That's how it all started. Which was the first name band then that you first sang with? Well, with Jack Hilton. It was Jack Hilton. Yes, uh -huh. Jack Hilton Orchestra. Now, I know that you've made many records. When did you first make a gramophone record? Well, the first one I made, I think it was 1927, with Jack Hilton at HMV Recording Studios in Hayes, Middlesex. Can you remember the title? Oh, yes. Uh, the first one was My Angeline. Very good. Yeah. Now, as I said, you've made an awful lot of records. Can you remember how many you actually appeared oh, on? Oh, no, no, no. Thousands. No, I couldn't tell you that. Well, actually, I've made thousands of them. If I counted, it'd take me about 50 years to count. <laughs> um, is it true, Sam, that you recorded for every different gramophone record company that we had in Britain pre-war? More or less, yes, I used to record for all the companies. I couldn't tell you, uh, I imagine I repeated the same number for every company. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> How did you get around contractual difficulties there, recording for different labels? Did you use different names yourself? No, I didn't use uh, different names myself. They picked the names and uh, they put them on the label. What they were, well, I couldn't say. So that you actually only recorded under your own name and record companies uh, chose other ones for you. Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, tell me, Sam, what was the setup like in the pre-war recording oh, studios? Oh, the pre-war. Entirely different to what it is today. We didn't get that 50 microphones around the studio. And you didn't have an echo unit? No, nothing like that. All you had was one microphone set in the middle. The instruments were placed round. I would be bob on the floor, more or less, waiting for my cue. Four, bar, four bars before, I would just bob up, sing the vocal chorus, bob down again and had to wait there till the record was finished. In those days of uh, record outputs where they were issuing many different records per week, how long did you actually get to learn a song? Learn a song? Hmm. No, ma'am. I read music. Uh, I learned to play the violin when I was a boy and I knew what music was. It shocked a lot of people, but... Uh, None of this uh, six weeks to learn a song. No, six, six minutes just to look through it. Very good. Of course, in those days, artists could read music, which is more than they can do today. I think a few of them could, uh, yes. Uh, was there a, a name band leader that you didn't sing or record with? Well, I couldn't say. <laughs> That's hard to say. Very difficult. I think I sang with most of them. As you were with all these different record companies pre-war, Sam, and I know that there were many recording in various types of studios, from little basement rooms and flats to the big companies, which actual record company did you prefer to work with? Oh, HMV. Definitely HMV. Definitely HMV. Yes, good recording. Yeah. Which band leader impressed you most? Ambrose. I'm afraid he was the best. What were the qualities that Ambrose had that others didn't have? Well, he knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted and he knew the sound he wanted. And the voice, he liked the voice he, and he liked the sound. And when he got the right sound, it passed. Till then, nothing was good enough. The 30s, Sam, was really the time when crooners um, reached their height or when they were really born. In the 20s, of course, almost anyone in the band could get up and bellow through a megaphone. But which of the crooners that were around in the 30s really impressed you? Well, there was just one, I think. Everybody says, Bing Crosby, Bing Crosby, that's all you heard. Yeah, the daddy of them all. Well, more or less, yes. Sam, what do you think actually killed the big bands in this country? Well, I think this guitar business came on. And, uh, well, every hotel had a pretty decent orchestra. But uh, the kids wouldn't go there. The kids wanted this beat stuff and the beat songs. And that's what's killed it. Maybe it'll come back one day. Who knows? I'd like to see that, definitely. Oh, I'd like to see it myself. Well, uh, in these days when the radios are bearing out day and night um, items which are supposed to be by singers, mm. what is your opinion of the standard of pop singing today? Well, it's not 
pop singing today. It's a noise, you know that. It's a beat, it's a gimmick. There haven't, there's not, you don't need a voice. If you've got a voice, you're going to have a struggle. You can listen to a few today. We have good men like Matt Monroe, great little voice, marvelous voice. I was told he's going to live in America. That's the only place for it. Yeah, they're driving them out of the country, I think. Absolutely. Do you think, looking on the optimistic side now, do you think the days of the big bands and crooners will ever come back? I don't think so. Well, maybe the hotels will bring it back, I think. And But you must have big dance bands for these dance halls. The Mecca people are the people that uh, use these big orchestras. And, of course, naturally, the big orchestras have to go with the beat, as you know. You see, they copy the beat, or do they play the beat? I couldn't say. But they're the only people that'll keep the big bands going. Yeah, we have a good example there with Joe Loss, who yes. has quite a good band. The daddy of the lot. Yeah, and he's forced... And Ken McIntosh, very good true, indeed. True, true. Yes. And yes. yet they're forced to play a lot of the rubbishy numbers that are around today. Well, naturally. <laughs> you know, Sam, a lot of people believe that big business and the get-rich-quick boys have caused the death of real artistry. Would you agree? Well, let's say I've listened to a few of these kids singing with these guitars tuppence to me, I think. But what can you say? The kids like it. Yeah, I've heard it said that they're ten a penny today, and I think that's about all they were. I think they'll go to twenty a penny shortly, <laughs> but they are maybe, maybe the big stuff will come back. The real voice and the real artist. Now, back to the important subject, which is you, Sam. Out of all the thousands of records that you made, have you got a particular favorite or uh, favorite? Yes, yes, yes. I'll, when day is done, and Body and Soul, that's my two favorite records. Now, as a point of interest, which Body and Soul, Sam? Because I think you've made quite a few versions. Only the Ambrose one. Wasn't a good one, wasn't perfect. I had a shocking cold that day, but it's still one of the best little records I think I've made, and it's one of the best sellers for Ambrose, actually. And the When Day Is Done was a very... Oh, that's a very big success, too. yes. That was one of the few 12-inch records which you made. Yeah, absolute. Yeah. Sam, as a, another point of interest, um, you've been singing, crooning, from early 1920s to yeah. the early 1950s. Yeah. Um, which period of your singing do you think was the best? Uh, 1947, 47, 48. 47, 48. Terrific. I, I, I was singing then. I was just matured just before I thought, now oh, this is the time to finish. Mm. <laughs> now that you're retired from business completely, Sam, yeah, yeah. do you often look back to the good old days with any form of nostalgia? Well, a little bit, but there you are. Let bygones be bygones. I, I've had the glory. I've enjoyed it. And now I'm taking it easy. And I'm waiting to see if there's another Sam Brown pop-up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think there was. Well, thanks very, very much for coming along, Sam, and talking to us. We'll fade out now with one of the records which you like best. All right, thank you very much. An interview done all those years ago, 42 years ago, when I was a young lad in London, talking there to Sam Brown, beloved crooner, of thousands of records. passed over over 40 years ago. Very few people were at his funeral. The rabbi said, what did he do for a living? Did he make much money? And they said, no, he was a crooner. He had no money. He said, he should have been a rabbi then. Here he is in the post-war period singing with Peter York and his orchestra. There's a land of 
beginning again Where skies are always blue Though we've made mistakes, that's true Let's forget the past and start life anew Though we've wandered by a river of tears Where sunshine won't come through Let's find that paradise where sorrow can't live And learn the teachings of forget and forgive In the land of beginning again Where broken dreams come privilege there to have met the great legendary Sam Brown, Britain's number one singer of popular ballads for the longest period of any of them. I always liked Sam and we kept in touch virtually until he died. As I say, he was penniless and the only job he could get was working in a betting shop off, uh, well, not far from Marble Arch. I remember walking with Sam through Piccadilly and looking at the people, I thought, they don't know who this wonderful man is. People of all ages just walking past. Nobody would heard of him, nobody knew him at all. Suddenly I heard a voice shout, Hi, Frankie! And I turned round, it was a bloke who was in my class at school, and I thought, blimey, of all the milling throng here in Piccadilly, nobody's recognised Sam Brown, but one chap has recognised me. He went to the school that I went to. And uh, it was just great seeing him again. But Sam, a wonderful man, and I'm so pleased that the society in his memory and honour is still thriving. 